Thanks for coming. Uh, my, name is, my name is Ben, and this talk is about testing Battle.net. Uh, and it's, I hope it's going to have um, a bunch of things that can be practical, that you can take home maybe to your own code bases. Uh, and it's about the stuff that I developed when I was uh, working on the Battle.net servers and the Battle.net client libraries uh, in C++, of course. So I'm going to sort of set the scene for you guys a little bit uh, before we get into the more interesting stuff. First few slides probably go fairly quickly. So Battle.net is about 325 and change thousand lines of C++, which means it's, it's not huge. You know, there are plenty of people at this conference who work on bigger code bases. Uh, but it's not that small. Which, it, there's plenty of stuff in there that's kind of varied. And so the kind of stuff you would expect to find uh, in a code base which has been worked on by, you know, a couple of dozen engineers over the course of maybe 10 years. Uh, and there's lots of sort of different things in there. And the main, the main few things that Battle.net does is authentication, uh, social services, um, matchmaking, which is pretty much the only thing that's not I.O. bound. So matchmaking is the kind of the, the CPU intensive task that Battle.net does, and then storing some stuff. Uh, and as I was saying, it's pretty varied, um, and it's highly asynchronous, um, to the point where you know, the mindset of a Battle.net programmer is that everything is asynchronous, because most things go between machines in multiple hops for any, for any given function call, you kind of think that way. Uh, and it's highly configured, which means you know, a lot of stuff gets read from configuration uh, at startup time, and there's a lot of telemetry that goes out. So I found myself, you know, maybe a few years ago, in this kind of familiar situation. You know, I'm, I'm a games industry programmer, I'm a career game programmer, I have very little practice at unit testing. It's not part of the games industry culture. Um, and here I am on this fairly large project for me, with many moving parts, that's for sure. Um, and as usual, you know, it's made up of lots of components, and there are sort of mature lower level libraries. So there's stuff that was written 10 years ago, hasn't been touched. Maybe it has unit tests in there. You know, there's a handful of unit tests from when someone thought it was a good idea. Um, but that code isn't changing. You know, those unit tests haven't changed in uh, a few years. And, and at the same time, you know, there's this constant drive to add features. So a team of half a dozen to a dozen engineers just adding stuff because we needed it yesterday. Um, so, you know, this is the stuff that's well tested in my code base. And probably if you're in a similar situation to where I was, it's probably also well tested in your code base. So these are kind of easy mode tests, right? These are things which, like I said, you put them in the code, you test them once, they never change. Um, and this is kind of what you find in all the unit testing literature. You know, these are the examples they give, and you're like, well, fine, that's, that's fine. Sure, I can write unit tests for that, but I don't need to. This is the stuff I need tests for, right? Large stuff, stuff in the large, as it were. Um, high dependency stuff, um, in particular, matchmaking algorithms, um, which, as I said, are one of the more CPU intensive things that, that the Battle.net backend does. And, and along with that is this kind of these queuing, load balancing algorithms. These are things that deal with real world data, maybe deal with a lot of it. Um, and you know, I can write them on my machine, and I can test them only so far, but then the production hardware scales up to you know, millions of players maybe. I can't run millions of players on my machine. Where do I start testing these things? So th there's really no magic bullet, right? And this is how I started out. I started out just you know, doing the legwork. Um, I wrote tons of mocks. I set up loads of data structures for test, you know. Uh, and that worked. That worked fine. It was a lot of code to take care of. Uh, and test code is code. And like any other code, it needs debugging. Um, but then I started to think, and I started to kind of figure out new ways to do things. And along the way of doing all this stuff and learning this stuff, I found some better techniques, and I found some better code structure. Just a little bit. So my first problem, which for some of you may be a familiar problem, is I'm, I'm working in the legacy code base. And there's lots of classes here which are kind of large. And uh, you know they've, they've been around a while. They've grown. So here's an example. Here's, a, here's an example I want to share with you. Uh, so this is a, a present, the implementation of a presence channel. Presence channel impl is a class. So a presence channel is a, is a, a channel that delivers kind of up to the second information about what your friends are doing, what games they're playing, you know, kind of what they're doing present uh, in a social sense. So 
presence channel impl derives from channel impl, which itself derives from channel base. So there's some idea of there's an interface class and an implementation class. And then channel base derives from this thing, an RPC implementer templated on the channel protocol type. So, so right away, you can see just from the hierarchy of this class, there's a mixing of concerns. We've got RPC way down at the bottom, and we've got the channel interface in a fairly sort of standard hierarchy sense, and then the impl, and then the presence channel. So any logic that the, the channel is doing in the presence channel impl is, is uh, you know, mixed in the same class with the RPC interface logic. So if I want to test this, where do I start? So let's look at the constructor. So the constructor takes this thing called an RPC dispatcher, um, which is a fairly you know, large interface class itself. Um, and then it takes a thing called a channel delegate. The delegate is the thing that kind of manages permissions for the channel. And then it's a whole load of what might be a whole load of configuration. And this constructor has what? One, two, three, six arguments. Uh, and at least three of them there, and maybe more, have very wide interfaces. So you can see just by, and, and, you know, and in addition, it derives from this three, four deep hierarchy. So the upshot is that if this is pretty hard to mock as it stands. Here's another example. Uh, this time the achievement service. <coughs> the class hierarchy not so deep here, but again, uh, I think the BNet achievement, achievement service is something protocol related. And we have this thing called a static data loader, which implies to me that on construction it might do some kind of I.O. And that's, you know, that's going to be something I need to figure out. And then the constructor arguments. Well, it's only a two arg constructor, but one of those arguments is a MySQL database. That might be quite a wide interface. <clears throat> and the other argument is this thing called a server helper. Now, server helper is interesting because w when we found we were writing more and more of these service classes, naturally we thought, well, we don't want to repeat stuff. We gather together stuff into a server, server helper to help them out. Server helper has a 12 arg constructor. And it, <laughs> it, I mean, it works, but it sort of, rather than fixing the problem, it sort of just sort of put a rubber stamp on the problem, right? <laughs> So I've said, yes, it's OK to do this, and here's how you do it. OK. So these things suffer from patterns which are enemies of testing. right? There's, there's no dependency injection. They, they could be doing a lot of work in the constructors. The constructors are, take a lot of arguments, and the things that you pass the constructor have wide interfaces. So this is a problem. So I started thinking about, you know, Traditionally, we have an interface impl split. But I started thinking, well, what do I really want to do to separate this stuff? Rather than having interface and implementation, what if I structure my class so that the base contains all of the logic that I can test, and then I just shunt all of the interactions down into the drive class? And I thought about this for a while, and uh, I decided to try it out. So, and, and in an in a, uh, inheritance sense, this is actually quite similar to uh, what it looks like in a compositional pattern, right? We're kind of used to this compos compositional pattern uh, in the games industry, um, where you would quite naturally put logic in components, and then your entity class would handle the interactions. Um, but it seems like we don't do it in a hierarchical sense. So I thought maybe doing it in a hierarchical sense might give me a, a step towards testing, and at least something to start with in terms of segregating the logic. So uh, I'm going to give you this example of um, how I split up uh, game queuing logic. So the game queue base um, is the thing that um, does all of the game queuing. And that means that uh, so we've got a limited amount of games that we can run at any one time. So that's, that's one thing, right? So when people come in and look for games, there's a certain number of servers that can run games. Uh, we have to kind of control, A, how many games are running in terms of server capacity but also the rate that games are started, because uh, even if uh, you can, so even if you can, you can run so many games, but the load profile of running a game is different from the load profile of starting a game. So you might be able to run, you might have enough server capacity to run 1,000 games. That doesn't mean you can start 1,000 games at the very same second. Uh, in addition, the queuing logic has to take care of things like, uh, different uh, data centers, maybe, 
people from different regions or different countries playing together, and in some cases putting them in a more advantageous data center for their ping time. So there's a moderate amount of, of logic that goes into game queuing. Anyway, so I tried to split this up in terms that we saw before, logic in the base, interactions in the import. So here's the game queue base. The class stands alone. It doesn't derive from anything. No RPC mixed in there, no nothing. So that's a good sign. Construct has five arguments, which is a little more than I normally like, but four of them are just callbacks, which is very, you know, one function interface. Uh, and the server pool interface is, is just the thing that uh, gives the game queuing uh, logic information about the server load. So it's not a particularly large interface. And it's, it, that's the thing I want to mock for my tests anyway. So I want to be able to say, oh, my servers are fully loaded, or they're not, or whatever. So that's a good start. And, and the, uh, the member functions it has, and I should point out that when you see uh, three dots in a thing, it's just because I omitted it for the slide. It doesn't mean a var args function. <coughs> the member functions are just kind of what you would expect a, a, queue, a queue to, to do, right? Push, pop, remove something from a queue. Um, from the middle of the queue kind of thing if, if players drop out and you know polling them because it's on the server side. So that's good. This looks like something I can test now. And it was a fairly easy thing to separate that logic and shunt it up into a base class. And now here's the impl. Naturally it derives from the base and it derives from the protocol. So it's going to be the thing that handles all the interactions, the protocol. We've got the protocol handler functions where players come in and come out. Uh, because we're running on the server, we've got some server events, you know, there's some interactions on the process level. Um, there's, there's some config. Now notice if I go back to GameCube base, um, I don't actually have a call here to, to configure it. One of, the, one of the important things for test is I decided that when I construct something, I shouldn't have to massively configure it afterwards. Now, although. You know, the game queue import does process some config and it takes care of that interaction. And then we've got more uh, kind of queuing stuff that just take care of ticking it around on the server. So here's another, here's another example, this time in a compositional sense. So the game master, or the game master impl here, is the thing that takes care of, once players get through that queue, then we actually have to make games, right? So the game master is the kind of thing that handles the protocol for making games. And how does it make games? Well, it delegates to a game factory. And so there are factories for each kind of uh, axis of games that you could choose. So there's one factory. When you play, for example, uh, Diablo 3, you say, I want to play this, this act on this difficulty. Uh, and there's a game factory for that. And if it were a different difficulty, different act, it would be a different game factory. If you were playing uh, you know, Hearthstone, a, a competitive matchmaking game, versus Diablo 3, a cooperative matchmaking game. Again, that's a different factory. So the factories, the things that actually do the work in terms of the matchmaking logic. <coughs> so here's the factory. Again, constructor, very small interface. Uh, this time even smaller than before. So pretty much just a version, a program ID, which is what, what game it relates to, and just an ID. Uh, it does have a configure call, but it's separate from the constructor, and again, if you construct one of these things, it's pretty much ready to go. Um, and again, pretty much what you'd expect uh, in terms of an interface to a factory. So you can register players to try and match into a game. They can drop out by unregistering. Or, or if you know, you know, if you want to join your friend in a game, that's when you say, I know the game I want to join because my friend told me, and that's join game. <clears throat> now the impl is where all the interaction happens. So here we see you know, all, all the hard stuff. Um, this stuff separated out so I can test. This stuff is the stuff I shunted down into interactions. So if, if, you know, if, if we get disconnection, um, this is a, the instantiate factories is effectively the configuration call that we saw before. Um, and then the protocol level kind of handlers that, that, uh, you know, that can be called from the outside world. So this turned out to be a pretty successful pattern, this, this logic in the base class interactions in the implementation class. Uh, it was fairly easy to apply to monolithic legacy classes, because all I had to do was like shove stuff up, shove stuff down, plumb together some bits. <clears throat> Wasn't too hard. Um, dependency injection, we all know, is a good thing for testing, and it, and it makes things testable. Um, and at the end of the day, some testing beats no testing. 
So you know, if you, if you can apply this just to one or two things, you're already getting somewhere. You're already getting traction. So you know, that's that's kind of learning number one. Um, constructors with small small number of arguments using narrow interfaces is is pretty important for testability. All right, so let's get on to some more interesting stuff. That was kind of a warm up. So here I am. I'm. Let me go back a slide. Here I am. I'm. I'm developing, let's say, matchmaking, and I'm wondering what's going to happen. You know, I write this algorithm. I have this data structure. I'm wondering what's going to happen when a million people come and start matchmaking into a game. And you know, here I'm sitting on my machine. I don't. I can't spin up a million people easily. Um, although, you know, we do do load tests, but that happens on a cadence which is not like a compile cadence. I'm a selfish engineer. I want to be able to see my code works quickly on my machine you know, in a kind of compile time cadence. Uh, sure, we run overnight tests and much more stuff that test the system level. Uh, but I, I want to know if my code can scale. So there's different solutions for different uh, size data sets, right? So if you're working when your data set's going to be like in the thousands, it almost doesn't matter what algorithms you use. It's pretty much all about the performance on the machine. It's about being cache friendly. It's about being nice to the machine. And the algorithm almost doesn't matter. If, on the other hand, you're at the other end of the scale, if you're a Facebook or a Google, and you have to deal with billions, data sets in the billions, then, then kind of algorithms are king, right? And, and you have to get things right by construction, or they just don't work. But, but Balnet is in this kind of million land where it's kind of tantalizingly, you can, you can be lazy and get things wrong and have things blow up. Because you know a, mi a million things in an array is not a large number. These machines can easily handle it. Um, and performance is important, right? Performance is important. It can, it can get you two orders of magnitude. But it's unlikely to get you five orders of magnitude. So even if you write something which is really cache friendly, if you get the algorithm wrong and a million people show up, bad things might happen. So the idea I had here was, you know, out, I realized that actually data structures and algorithms were important to, for efficiency and not just for you know, cache friendliness and all that stuff I, I can actually measure on my machine. So what can I do? Well, I can time the tests. And this is, again, this is easy mode. And, and if I'm optimizing, time tests give me some idea of if I'm optimizing, if I'm, if I'm doing well, right? But fundamentally, my machine is different from the machine these things are going to run on in production. Um, and it's, I can't tell, therefore, from a t time test, a simple time test on my machine, if it's fast enough. I can tell if I'm making it faster, and that's a good thing. So I, I use t time tests for that. But fast enough, that's, that's a different thing. So I, I started thinking about this. And uh, the other thing about efficiency is it's really easy to lose. So even if I write a data structure, I write an algorithm, and I can be sure that, and I've reasoned about it, and I've thought about it, and I can be sure that it's, you know, the dividing line really is I want it to be sublinear, so log n or less, right? Order n is not going to cut it with a million, million games open, a million players on the service. Um, even if I do that today, and I commit it, and I code review it, and I check it in. Um, you know, next week, everyone's still hacking on features. Maybe someone needed to change that algorithm up. Very easy to accidentally put something in which turns your nice algorithm into order n. Um, so, I, so I thought, well, I, you know, what I really need here is a way to test for algorithmic efficiency. Um, and I can recommend a long commute, two hours a day on the 405, helps you think. <clears throat> and so I thought. I was thinking about this, and I, and I came up with this really simple idea. And it seemed so simple that I wondered if it could work. And if it would work, I wondered why everyone wasn't doing it. And so, so what does it really mean when something is order n, right? It means that if we run it once on the input of size n, it takes some time, call it t1. And then we run it on the input of size kn, it should take, should take k times as much time. I mean, to a first approximation. If we forget about the smaller terms, we assume that the order n term dominates. That means that if we run it twice on different sized inputs, 
and then divide through the, divide through the times, we should be able to tell, independently of how long it actually takes, what its order is. Um, and as for n, so there are very simple calculations you could do for you know, things I'm interested in, really. So constant time, log n time, order n time, and so on. And like I say, the dividing line really is I want stuff to be sublinear in this world. So this idea seemed almost too simple to be workable, but I tried it out. Of course, timing is hard, you know, wibbly wobbly, timey wimey stuff. If you've been to Bryce's talk or Chandler's talk, my talk is much, much less scientific, but you know, it worked for me. Um, and so I tried to do something mitigating for, you know, things like cache warming effects, uh, machine load, and kind of sensitiv sensitivity to the granularity of the timing function, just like, you know, many of us I'm sure have done profiling. Um, and, and some, like I say, very unscientific statistical mitigation. Um, and I settled on, you know, I, so I want my unit test to run quickly. So I can't make these numbers too big, because I want it to run in the sort of time frame that I won't notice, you know, a second or two at the end of compile kind of thing. So I settled on, um, you know, a multiplier of 32, because we always pick powers of two as computer scientists when an arbitrary number is, is needed. Uh, and n is 100. Well, I don't know particularly why. <coughs> so now I have this testing framework, which is something like this, which you know runs the test once, and my run function takes how how many how many inputs it should have, uh, and then I run it again, and I divide through, and the testing framework does something like that. Um, now the remaining sort of problem here is how do I make these different sized inputs? So to start with, I can just build them into the test, right? That's okay, that works. Again, it's a lot of test code. Um, and it means that you know, you've got to put your timing inside the test, you've got to make sure your timing doesn't account for your setup time inside the test. You've got to do a bunch of stuff. It ends up bloating your tests. Nevertheless, it, it, amazingly, it did work. Um, but my typical test for, some, for something like this matchmaking would be 40 lines of boilerplate, um, 10 lines more of the timing code, only, you know, only five or 10 lines of actual code that does real work. So wasn't happy with that entirely. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, this, this approach actually worked enough, and well enough to give me some confidence shipping. And I think we did ship Diablo 3 when I was kind of in this mode. Um, so I knew at that point from doing this that matchmaking wouldn't blow up with a million players. And I lived with this for a little while. Uh, but I'm lazy and, and the code is, has to be maintained. I didn't want to maintain it all the time. I wanted to be able to write more and not keep bloating. So the thing is, in my spare time, I'm a student of Haskell. And Haskell has this thing called Quick check, which is property-based testing, which generates test input automatically for you. It's kind of like magic in Haskell. It's less like magic in C++, as you'll see. Uh, but so the idea of property-based testing is that uh, instead of saying a, a individual test case, instead of writing it, thinking out an individual test case, um, you think of a property which is true for every input. Um, and the testing framework just generates random inputs and feeds them to you, and you say whether the property is true. So this is what, so I started with, you know, now in the practice of unit testing, I started writing this wishful thinking code. <clears throat> so I have, you know, fairly standard sort of test framework, which has, you know, a macroed uh, test thing like this. You get a test name in a suite, it does something, it returns a result. What I want is for it to, you know, I want to say, well, this test is going to take a, an argument and I'm going to assert, I'm going to, I'm going to test whether the property holds for this argument and return it. So, uh, like I say, wish-driven development. So what does this actually mean? How do we generate arguments? Well, the way we solve everything in C++ with templates. Um, and, you know, in Haskell it's called arbitrary, so naturally I called it arbitrary. And so, how can we write this generate function? So, for any type, for any given type, 
we want to generate things of this type. So we're going to take a couple of arguments. One is some idea of um, the complexity of the thing we're generating, the generation. So you know, generations. The idea is that we'll go from generation zero, one, two, and the thing might get gradually more complex as we sort of as we as we go along. And then uh, just a random seed because we're generating random things and we'd like to be able to reproduce them. So this is the base template, uh, and then we then we just specialize it. So it's pretty easy to specialize this uh, for arithmetic types. Uh, we can we can write a, a small function to front load the likely edge cases of failure. So zero, uh, min, and max. Otherwise, a random uniform distribution over the range. So it looks something like this for for integer-like types, right? So this generation parameter we're using to front load uh, the the inputs or, or the the things that are generated. Uh, so there's zero, min, and max. And otherwise, if we're in any generation after that, we just generate a random integer or, you know, you can see how it would be trivial to generate random bool or char. I, th I think I limit it to printable chars for char. Um, now, I know when some of you are looking at the slide, you're thinking, that crazy guy is putting a mouse and twister on the stack every time. It's formatted for the slide. In reality, I don't do that. Maybe some of you aren't thinking that, but I work with people who immediately would <coughs> call me out on that. <laughs> so, so that's what generate looks like for integer-like types, right? And, and kind of arithmetic types. And uh, So how would we do it for uh, compound types, for our containers, for our structs? Well, we can, you know, a container contains something. We already know how to generate the thing it contains. Uh, so it's kind of like an algebraic data type approach. Um, if we, we can write the arbitrary t generation in terms of the underlying data types. And for a vector, it looks something like this. So imagine t in this case is a vector of, of whatever. Um, pull out the value type. And this time, the, so the generation is going to control the length of the vector, or the string, or whatever, whatever container it is, right? So this is just a kind of simple you know, for the first 100 generations, it's going to be like 10. For the next 100, it's going to be like 20. It's a very trivial way to, to control that. So the generation gives you some idea of the complexity of the input. Um, and then we just generate n values of the contained type using our existing template that's specialized for integer types or whatever. So specialize this template in a very similar way for all the kind of simple types, and likewise for all the compound types. And then we have a pretty good framework for generating whatever we want. So now, how do I, now I can, you know, instantiate that template, tell it to generate things of a certain type. Now I need to say, so what is this, you know, this is back to my wishful thinking code. How can this work? So this is a macro, and it has uh, my, my parameter at the end here. So how does it expand? Well, typically in a test framework, it might expand to something like this. It makes some struct with a nonce type, uh, a nonce name, you know. Uh, and it provides operator paren, which takes the parameter here. And then, then we need to take apart, the, the introspect the operator paren to figure out the argument of the function. So this is, we can do this with a very simple function traits template. So my, my struct has operator paren. And so when you put it into function traits, it, it uh, triggers, triggers this instantiation, which derives from uh, this one, which in turn derives from this, uh, this one and pulls out my argument type. So, and there's a bunch, omitted from the slide is all the constant volatile qualified things and blah, 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 what have you. But this is the basics of it, right? So I can very easily pull out the type of the first argument of my structs operator paren. So having done that, then I want to provide, so my, here's my non-struct again, a different part of it. Now, my test framework knows how to run tests. So there's a, there's a test interface, and it has a run function. So my, my property struct, uh, my, my generated struct derives from test, and its macro 
This macro provides the operator paren, and then this is uh, common to all of them. They just they have a run function, which uh, creates a property and returns property dot check. So I've discovered I know how to discover the type. I know how to generate the type. What I need to do here is basically type arrays type arrays the struct I've created. I know it has operator paren, and I know it can be run. So I know, and I know what type its operator paren takes. If I type arrays it, then I can write the machinery to generate that, generate that parameter and call it. And property is the thing that does the type erasure. So it uses a fairly standard uh, type arrays idiom. Um, nothing particularly out of the ordinary here. So the constructor is a template, which uh, takes its argument, which an f, f in this case uh, is, is my non-struct with the operator paren, so it's a callable object. It squirrels it away inside this internal base, which itself is a template derived from internal, uh, sorry, internal is the template derived from internal base. Internal base is, provides the check interface, right? And then my property check ends up just calling check through that virtual call. <coughs> So that's, that's the basic type arrays pattern. And, and all the magic happens inside the internal, which at this point has captured the type of, of the thing I passed in. Right? So when I call internal check, uh, it, no, it gets the param type as before. It takes it apart. It takes uh, its template parameter apart with the function traits to discover the first argument type just decays it, because then it will pass it to arbitrary. Uh, inside the check function, so and that's, where, that's where the magic happens. That's where we call arbitrary generate. And then finally, call mt here is the actual non-struct that I passed in. And I'm going to call it with the correct parameter type, having generated it. So that's, that's the basic machinery that I put together. So let's see that in action. Um, I do want to be here. So, okay. For example, come on. Okay. So, I'm going to have my property take a string, and I'm just right now going to print it out. Uh, and test. Let's see. Okay. Okay, can everyone see that? So if I now run, so what we should see is that that thing will, so the machinery will generate strings and call that function a bunch. I think 100 by default. So we should see a bunch of random strings come out. All right, there they are. <coughs> and uh, the first one is actually the empty string. You can see that right, right, under, the, right under the run line there. So for strings, it, it front loads the empty string, which is usually a fairly good idea. All right, great. So far, so good. Can generate random things of, of, of pretty much any type. So now I can do that. Oh, so here's, so here's can, just a recap for you guys. So the macro takes, it takes its argument and expands to make a non-struct. Then the property type erases that, and internally does the deduction of the argument type with the function traits calls arbitrary of t generate to make it, calls this operator paren, and the rest is plumbing with the random seed and the, and the number of checks. Like I say, 100 by default. So, so this is pretty nice. Now I have property-based tests. <coughs> but this, before I go to uh, you know, using this to, to generate my input from, because what I want to do, remember, my ultimate goal is to test the algorithmic complexity. Before I before I moved on to that, there's one more thing that quick check does and that all good property-based testing stuff does. And that is that when a check fails, you want to find the minimal failure case. And so the other thing that arbitrary does besides generate is shrink. So the idea is that you've given your test some input and it's failed, right? You want to kind of shrink that input down in some way to see if it still fails. And in that way, get a minimal failure case. So shrink in some way has to return a vector of shrunken or reduced t's in some way. 
So, you know, a pretty easy way to do that, for example, for strings is just chop the string in half. So this is shrink for strings, and shrink for compound types, all compound types works pretty much this way right now. Um, shrink for, you know, ints and balls is a kind of more meaningless, but for comp compound types are what we often need. So as you can see here, chops the string in half, just, just does size divided by two, and just returns a vector of the first half and the second half. That, that's all it does. And then the machinery, the test running machinery, when it finds a fail, it calls shrink, it calls the test again with you know, the things that shrink returns, and it basically follows the failure case down the tree. And, it, and uh, so I'm gonna show you a little demo of that. Uh, let's see, okay. All right, so here I have a test case that will fail if the string contains an A, right? So uh, now there's always the danger here that the random, this is random generation, it might not contain an A. Um, in which case we'll just run it again until, until it does. <laughs> Let's see now. Okay, might not contain an A. Ah, but that one did contain an A, okay. So you can see that shrink in action. So that first string, let me blow it up for you guys a little bit. So it failed on 8Z, curly, and A, whatever. Um, chopped it in half. The second half succeeded, so didn't bother following that case. But the first half failed again. You can see how it chopped it down, and chopped it down, chopped it down. And finally, we get the minimal failure case. Um, and, you know, so this is the random seed plumbing, like I said before. Uh, if I do the same thing again and give it the random seed, then we should see exactly the same output. So that's, you know, that's also a nice property I want for my unit test, that they're repeatable. Okay, great. This, this is now getting close to what I want. <clears throat> so, now that we can generate all these things, let's go back to the algorithmic test. Because Remember, I have all these 80 to 100 line tests. I just want to delete the code. <laughs> but but there's, there's, a, there's a small thing I need to take care of. So remember, generate generate has this kind of fuzzy idea of the thing it generates. It, it, it uses this generation idea. So I need a tighter form of generate. Well, that, that's easy. I'll just call it generate n. And instead of doing this fuzzy idea of a generation, I'll use the actual value of the generation that was passed in. So that, you know, because when I run my al algorithmic tests, Kind of important that I know the exact size of the input. So generate, as you can see, is exactly the same. Generate n is exactly the same as generate. Only difference is that I don't do this kind of fuzzy idea of the generation, but I just use it directly. So now here's a, here's a sample um, complexity test. <coughs> um, so what I do in this case is, again, the parameters at the end, I just have this enum, like should it be order n, should it be order one, should it be order log n, whatever. And then I do something in a test that's supposed to be whatever, you know, order n in this case, max element that better be order n, I think. Um, and so the machinery runs the test, you know, a bunch of times, multiplies the size of the input, runs the test a bunch more times, um, divides through, does minimal statistical outlier smoothing, like I said, not very scientific compared to Bryce and Chandler, but it worked for me. Um, and then basically figures out which, which bucket the input should be in, because it knows ahead of time, you know, if it takes, the, if, it, if, if the multiplier is, or if the, you know, if the divide through factor is this, then it's order one, if it's close to this, it's log n, it's n, et cetera. It's pretty simple code, just, just figures out the, the kind of closest thing that's under. And, it, and it, if it's, you know, like if it's, for example, if I say it's order n, and it turns out to be all the log n, well, that's still a test pass. And in fact, calls for celebration, perhaps. Uh, the other nice thing about this is, of course, that normally we pro when we profile, we profile in, in release mode without debugging. But I can be pretty sure that if I turn off debugging, de uh, you know, if I run in release mode rather than debug, optimization actually is only going to make things better. I hope it doesn't make things worse. And so if my, if my algorithms order, n or the log n in, in debug, I can be pretty sure it's the same in, in release. Like, and in a sense, I can be more sure in debug because the, com the compiler isn't like pulling stuff out of my functions and doing weird things. 
like the code will execute more or less as I wrote it. So that's nice too. <clears throat> so here's a before and after. Now that you're not supposed to be able to read this. This is just for for show for for you know a sense of it. But this is this is an example of a test I had. This is I think about 80 lines, and you know if if you squint at this, maybe you can see there's 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 a bunch of stuff. So before is on the left, after is on the right. So first of all, I, I can pull out all the code that, that generates, that's just there for generating stuff. I can pull out code that times stuff, because now that I'm not doing the generation in there, I don't need to shove the timing in. I can do the timing on the outside, because the test's only doing what it's supposed to do. And, you know, and there's some other refactoring I can do to get rid of other stuff, just because stuff got simpler. And so now what was 80 lines is now about 20 lines, and most of them are actually doing work, which is good. So, um, the reward for good work is more work, as they say. Um, so, this is kind of where I am now. There's, um, so, uh, as I've learned, dependency injection is, is what we need for testing. You know, that, that, that is already known. Um, but separating logic from interaction in this kind of shove logic in the base class way and shove all the interactions down makes the base class, makes my logic much more testable. Um, Keeping my constructors small, keeping my constructors' interfaces small, very important. So I still have regular tests for my, like my normal cases where I can identify um, what might go wrong. Uh, I still have time tests for when I'm optimizing that give me some sense of am I making things better. But now I also have these property-based tests for invariance. And they take, a, to be honest, they take a little bit of practice to write because it's, you know, it can be challenging to figure out what's the actual invariance, but it can also be rewarding to figure out you know, what are the invariants of, my, of what I'm doing? And now I have these, you know, now that I can generate stuff, I can have these algorithmic complexity tests. So I know that my matchmaking algorithm will not blow up beyond all reason when a million players come onto the service. So what's the future? Uh, what's, what's that? Well, arbitrary is kind of a lightweight in-process fuzz testing. You know, it's nothing like as robust as, as, as Kostya's Lip fuzzer, um, but but it's something, and you know the kind of the important thing about all this stuff is it runs fast. It runs when every time I compile, it's you know by engineers for engineers in a very selfish sense is a, is is what I like about you know being an engineer. <laughs> um, it struck me that since I am kind of generating things. Um, the way in which I generate them forms some kind of walk through the input space of my function. And so there might be alternative walk strategies that I could use. I haven't really looked into that a lot yet, but it's something I have on, on my mind. Um, also, it's been suggested that uh, because I have this uh, algorithmic complexity testing, I can actually, I can see when certain inputs, you know, trigger really bad runtimes. And I can capture that kind of 99th percentile uh, sort of stuff. <clears throat> and, and I'm still lazy. Um, what was I going to say about 99th percentile? Somebody, somebody at work mentioned to me that that was a good, a good use case, I think. So um, that's, that's the end of the main part. I have some bonus slides I can show you since we've we got a little bit more time. Um, so people see this and they say, what do they say? So sometimes I ride a unicycle around the office. When people see me riding a unicycle, what's the number one thing they say? Oh, can you juggle as well? <laughs> and, I, and I get off the unicycle and I say, why don't you try? And then, and then they go away. <laughs> but they see this and they say, oh, that's cool. Can you do multiple arguments? So I didn't start with, but it turns out you can do multiple arguments. Because we have var args in macros now. And so I started looking at this. Um, so once again, you know, here's my, here's my property macro. I've got var args. So now it expands to give me an operator paren with multiple arguments. So now how do, I, how do I take that apart? Well, now my function traits can, can look at the tuple of arguments. So, so this is what I do now. So I get the tuple of arguments instead of, instead of uh, you know, just the one argument. And then I have this apply and unpack apply, which is pr 
pretty much the same as experimental apply. I, you know, on my compiler, I don't yet have experimental apply, but this is kind of uh, trivial to write and more or less the same. So in particular, when you call apply, it creates the index sequence for the parameter pack. And then, you know, unpack apply it effectively calls the function and expands that parameter pack for the function arguments. So doubtless, if you've been to one of the, I don't know, a million uh, presentations that mention something like this, you, you'll have seen this. And then, so now, now that I have this, all of my property tests uh, effectively take tuples as arguments. And so now I need a way to shrink tuples. All that other shrinking stuff will happen still on the leaves of my kind of shrinking tree. Uh, but I need a way to, to shrink the tuples. Um, so I had already written, you know, shrinking for basic types and in integral types and compound types. Uh, so before thinking about tuples, I thought about pairs because they're kind of a simple version of tuples. I thought that might be... So I went back to my uh, implementation of shrink for pairs, all excited to do this, and I saw a comment that said to do. <laughs> so, so I went back on my commute, took a few hours on the 405. Uh, and I thought, well, I can shrink pair just by shrinking the first item and shrinking the second item. And then I thought, well, should I do a Cartesian product of the vectors in the pairs or something like that? Should I do something like uh, applicative for lists? You know, I'm. I was thinking Haskell at the same time, so I was thinking quick check. Um, so, so here's what I, I came up with. I, I came up with not doing the Cartesian product, um, but, just, but just shrinking the first thing, and then just putting that together with the unshrunk second thing, and then doing the reverse. So shrinking the second thing and putting that together with the unshrunk first thing just return that. So that's the way I shrink pairs. Shrink one half, shrink the other half. And the machinery takes care of kind of getting me a minimal case. So now that I have pairs, I'm thinking about, OK, that's great. How about tuples? So naturally, I go to cppreference.com to see what's available for tuples. And I see make tuple. No, that's not the thing. Tie, well, that's interesting, but no. Forward is tuple, no. Get, sure, but no. Tuple cat, wait a minute. Tuple cat. What can I do? Well, what I really want, if I'm sticking together first and second, what I really want for tuple is, is you know, sticking together head and tail kind of thing. I can shrink the head, and I can shrink the tail if I do it recursively, because I'm shrinking a tuple and the tail is a tuple. So I look at tuple cat, and what I really want are tuple head, or I have that already, that's get of zero, tuple tail, which I don't have yet, uh, and tuple cons, which could be implemented in terms of tuple cat, but I kind of went for more functional programmer purity. I wanted to use tuple cons. Um, so I thought, well, let's just pretend these things exist so I can write shrink for tuples. And shrink for tuples looks just the same as shrink for pairs. We just, we shrink the head, and then we stick it, we cons it onto the, the tails, unshrunk. We shrink the tails, and then we cons it onto the unshrunk head. So this is exactly the same as we do for pairs. So all we need to do is write tuple, well, we've got tuple head. We just need to write tuple tail and tuple cons. Well, tuple cons is, is trivial. Tuple cons is very similar to, to make tuple, I think. And it uses this pattern where you just make the index sequence for the tuple, and you call through, and you call make tuple, having unpacked the existing tuple. So tuple cons, very easy. Tuple tail, only a little only a little more difficult. Um, but by now, I was getting the hang of using um, index sequence, which I think, by the way, is awesome and one of the most amazing features of C++11 or 14. Um, so to make a tuple tail, what I want to do is take an index sequence one less than the length of the tuple and just shift it by one. And that's what this code is doing. So you can see the top function here makes an index sequence which is one less than the tuple length. And then the bottom one expands it out, just adding one. So instead of 0 through, uh, I guess, n minus 2, we get 1 through n minus 1, which is exactly the tail that we need. So shrink works. I, I take my shrunken heads, and I put them onto the normal tail. I take my shrunken tails, and I put them onto the normal head, cons them on, and that's shrink for tuples. Just the same as shrink for pairs. And now, 
uh, that's pretty much where I am. And uh, you can look at the code at your leisure. It's on GitHub. And thank you, and I'll take questions if you have any. Yeah. So all the complexity tests, do you run them just locally, or do you run them on like a continuous integration system as well? I run them locally. Uh, to, so do I run them? Do I run the complexity test locally or on a continuous integration system? Uh, I do run some on the continuous integration system. With complexity tests, they tend not to be. I, I tried my hardest to make them binary pass fail. But as you can see, there's randomness in there. I, just from a sense of safety, I tend not to run them on the continuous integration. Uh, but I was running them constantly as I was developing the system, you know, because like I said, it's so easy to accidentally, accidentally get the wrong complexity in there. Um, that, to be honest, they're pretty safe. You can make them pretty safe. You can make them pretty binary pass fail. I just really didn't want to take the chance of, of blowing a unit test just Owing to some random randomness overnight. Yeah? So, um, I'm not in the gaming industry, I'm just a curious fan, but I, I assume you guys also do like live performance testing um, or like collecting statistics on performance. Um, is, is that a thing Blizzard does? And can you talk more about that? Uh, well, we have a whole load of telemetry that we do. Um, Okay, so you're asking about if we, if we collect statistics on performance. Um, we, do, we do do a whole load of telemetry. Um, we also have, um, like I was saying near the top of the talk, a whole system. This, this is my kind of selfish engineer's test for my machine, so I can be sure about my code. But we have a whole team that does integration tests, uh, and they, they wrap things up with C sharp. Um, in fact, <clears throat> Our corporate GitHub appliance thinks that Balnet is written in C sharp because the number of lines of C sharp test code actually outweigh the number of lines of C++ code. Uh, but but yes, we, we do do a bunch more testing. Yeah, in the back. Uh, I think this probably just answered my question. I was wondering how you, you would ensure that the test, you, uh, the code that you were refactoring to make it testable, how, may, how did you make sure that, how did you ensure that uh, you re retained the functionality? You know? Right. So, how do you get started testing because you don't have tests to ensure that your refactorings still preserve the functionality? <laughs> um, well, I don't really know the answer to that, except it's better after you have tests. <laughs> um, let me put it this way. Before you have tests, everyone's refactoring everything willy-nilly anyway. So your refactoring to put tests in is going to be no worse than any other particular development that's going on from day to day. We all, as, yes, thank you, Ian. We also have testers. Um, and they, you know, they're the second line of defense after unit tests, third line after unit tests and system tests. So that, you know, we have, we have QA personnel, they, they test it all the time. We have lots of players who test it, although we try not to make them test it. <laughs> yeah. Can you show some sample code about how you set the expectations on your mocks? Like, how do you make it return different values and stuff like that? Like, you basically said, like, here's how you do your link time substitution or your inheritance substitution to get rid of I.O. based stuff. But, like, how do you, within your tests, like, uh, say, uh, you know, this network socket does this, this, and then this? Okay. Um, Can you show a code I, example? Well, or? Uh, no, I, can't, I, I couldn't say we really do a whole lot of that, in fact. Um, so yeah, yeah. My, mock, my mocks are more or less hard-coded. I don't use any particular mocking framework. I don't use anything that introspects the classes or the executable. Uh, 
so with your test API, how, when you pass string as a parameter, how do you limit uh, like size of the string when you generate an input for it? How do I limit the size of the string? Oh, that's, uh, so remember the generation parameter? That, where are we? Here, right? So, the gen so to start with, um, when you call the executable, you can, by default, it will generate 100 checks for every test. And you can tell it how many checks you want to generate. And this generation parameter g just monotonically counts up from zero. Um, so the length of the string in this case will be uh, 10 for the first 100 generations, then 20, then 30. Um, there's, no, there's no code to, to particularly limit it to any maximum size because there doesn't need to be. Um, I wouldn't, you know, if, if I ran it with, I don't know, millions and millions of generations, then I might get some long strings, but also that's not the kind of thing I would do because that might take a long time. Mm -hmm. Okay, and from API perspective, when you define, we define a test, like if you need to generate container with, uh, well, how, so you have to have two parameters, I guess. One, a container itself, and second, to, to define size of the container. So say your test uh, takes input std vector, yes. and, uh, well, you need to define, so 100 is a, well, each, is, it's basically, everyone is a test, a separate test input. Well, I'm talking about test input, uh, that just a test vector with uh, some number of uh, elements. I'm not sure I understood the driving point of your question. Well, the way I understood, like with uh, std string, uh, when it takes std string, each element is a test input, right? In, in your setup. Each, when you generate a string, if, you have, if your test takes a string, then a string is generated. Yes, so test string. input yeah. is the entire string, or test input is a, like uh, uh, the test one, input one, would, one character? If your test takes a string, the test input would, would be the entire string. All oh, right, okay, okay, then the, I, yeah, the, I got it, okay. All right, thank you. Um, a question I sometimes get is, um, you know, how, how do I set this up for my own classes? Um, and so it's a matter of uh, specializing arbitrary and implementing generate, which is typically not too difficult. Um, an interesting thing arises if you have a function that you know that, you're, say you're gonna take an integer, but you know the integer is bounded. Uh, unfortunately, there's no easy way to do that just with an integer in C++, and so sometimes I would, I would wrap the integer in a struct whose constructor made sure that the integer was bounded and then unwrap it in the test or something like that. Um, but go ahead with your question. Um, so your tests <clears throat> actually test uh, the asymptotic complexity and then from that uh, you are guessing that at scale it would still work because you know what's the asymptotic complexity at smaller scale, right? That is the idea. So how do you account for the constants? Uh, you know, imagine that you have an algorithm that you don't know the asymptotic complexity uh, and then and the, uh, the real asymptotic complexity behind the algorithm could be n plus, let's say, n squared divided by a large constant. And then for smaller uh, numbers, the yeah. n squared would never be a significant factor, but at, you know, like, when then you deploy and then you have billions of users and then n squared would become, uh, you know, uh, a dominant. Uh, right, right. So, so how that works? I try and set my tests up and my, my test multiplier up to, to elucidate the dominant term, basically. And I, you know, good enough is good enough. I try and forget about the rest. The, the, any constant multipliers come out in a division anyway. Um, so, for each, so on this slide, um, you know, so if something is order n, technically that means it's a n plus some other terms smaller than n, right? But I, I try and set up my test so that those other terms won't matter. And, you know, it, it varies a little, you know, there, there are tweaks I make here and there to my tests, but it, it's something, and something's better than nothing, and good enough is good enough. So, if, I'm sorry if that's an unscientific, unsatisfactory yeah, I, answer. I think that um, it, that's fine if that other thing is a constant, but not yeah. if that other thing is dependent on n. Like n, well, so imagine. So if it was dependent on n, if it dominated, it would come out as n order n squared and not order n, for instance. Uh, it would come out if the n is large enough. So imagine n plus n squared divided by c, where c is, let's say, a very large constant that is 
then your, your echo tire in question oh, is I, I see what you're saying. dominated by n yeah. because yeah. Uh, the c is a large number. So to combat that kind of thing, I guess I, I still do code reviews. Uh, and you know, because at the end of the day, this doesn't replace the fact that I still need to know everything my data structures and algorithms are doing. Um, that those those this is about really catching unintended changes, um, and those kind of the kind of scenarios you're you're talking about haven't really occurred for me. Okay, thanks. Costia. Yeah. The, the, yeah, the, I mean, the code's on GitHub. It's under an MIT license. I'm not saying it's anywhere near production ready, but it, it, it works. Um, I'd be interested to take any pull requests anyone has. That's cool. Uh, there was a lightning talk about rapid check. Apparently, um, I haven't looked at rapid check. Um, but yeah, this is. I mean, right. So this, I think this is an idea whose time has come. Maybe um, languages with uh, lots of other languages have property-based testing. C++ is relatively late to the game. Um, other languages tend to have be ones that either have reflection or have strong type systems, like Haskell. But I think C++'s type system is good enough, uh, as I've shown. Um, so, so yeah, I'm excited to see this kind of uh, new things in, in testing for C++. Yeah, um, Florian from Spotify. Uh, our colleague who works uh, rapid check libraries and in this talk, but I'm sure it would be really interesting to talk to you about uh, his library and how you he implemented his and to compare with yours because they are really similar, I think in design and how they work. And they are doing the same uh, shrink of uh, test data and right. a lot of things like that. So it right. would be really interesting to compare. But diversity is good. Absolutely. Also. Thanks. I think we have time for one more question. Oh, I've got the last question again. So have you noticed any uh, change in the way software is developed at your company since you've done this as a result of it? Um, engineering culture is hard to change and I, it's something I'm continually working on. Um, I couldn't say I've, I've noticed any sea change overnight but you know people are definitely interested in testing their code so that's a good thing. All right thank you very much.